right. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, hedge funds and changing investor demands. Um, do you guys want to introduce yourself a little bit, uh, just briefly? Sure. My name is Ron Geffner. I'm a partner with the law firm Sadis and Goldberg. By way of background, started my career at the SEC, where I used to prosecute money managers. Okay, I tried to see if the crowd quieted down a little there. On average, we form 60 to 80 funds per year. We represent over 1,000 funds. It's both hedge, private equity, venture capital, real estate, and commodity pool. Uh, my name is Chris Kulik. I am the chief strategist and acting CEO of Analytical Research. We are an advisory group that focuses on alternative investments, primarily hedge funds, providing um, monitoring, operational due diligence, and reporting for primarily large institutions uh, and pension funds. Uh, good afternoon, Rob Christian. I'm head of research and a portfolio manager at K2 Advisors. We're the hedge fund group within uh, Franklin Templeton. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ani Chaudhary. I lead the investment management practice of TCS. We advise institutions on a non-discretionary basis. And prior to that, I spent seven years with Gore-Tex Fund of Funds, both in research as well as portfolio management. Thank you. All right, um, so let's start with the elephant in the room, which I think I saw behind the bar there, which is uh, hedge fund performance being uh, pretty uh, subpar lately, particularly uh, in October. Um, it's kind of been an era, at least for my seat, of uh, uh, disappointing returns. Um, uh, Rob, do you want to get us started on that, that idea? Yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. Putting definitely, we'll, we'll get right to the elephant. Um, it's definitely been a tough a uh, year that you could, we could talk all day about the different reasons why. Um, but on a go forward basis, as usually in these periods, the, the opportunities is quite big, I think. See, basically, um, I'll just start off by quoting this statistician who taught for many years at the Baruch College. His name was Aaron Levenstein, and he very famously remarked that statistics reveals what's interesting, but conceals what's vital. So basically, you know, when you make that statement that they have underperformed, there seems to be an implicit assumption of comparison, and that comparison happens to be with broader equity markets, which kind of is not a fair comparison. Number two, if you think of it, why do I invest in hedge funds? What should we be comparing them to, if not the equity markets? So basically, you have to compare the reason for investing in hedge funds, and the second point was to basically temper the volatility and have a higher sharp ratio. So basically, you have to think of the returns in terms of returns per unit of wall, rather than just saying they underperformed by five points now. Because my reason for investing in hedge funds to begin with wasn't to replicate something that I can anyway get from the broadly equity markets, right? I had a different rationale for doing it. And thirdly, I believe that, you know, we talk of hedge fund investment as one homogenous group, really. Because hedge funds consist of varied strategies, and within those strategies, the dispersion is pretty significant. You look at long short, for example. All long short are not the same. So my conclusion will be that the environment for hedge funds was not the best over the last couple of years. And I would agree with Rob that going forward, they have a broader opportunity set. But I think the way we compare, we have to compare apples and apples and not apples and oranges. Can I just add another thing? It's also the fu a function of who is reporting their performance. So there is a theory and there are studies that indicate smaller managers outperform larger managers, right? Emerging managers, possibly from large institutional. And I would have, my experience has been many of these smaller emerging managers fail to even report their numbers. And so I'm curious how that, their perspective on how that affects this question. See, basically, if you think of it, it's a self-reporting mechanism, right? If I'm doing well, I'll report. If I'm not doing well, I'm not mandated to report my numbers to any of the indices. So eventually, the indices, you know, they become a manifestation of the market itself because all the larger players are able to garner the assets. My view is that I think the, you know, the, the, the you know, following on what you're saying, that, that usually the, the reported numbers that we're seeing are probably even better than what is generally happening. Uh, but yeah. th that's my view. 
And, and I'm just trying to highlight that yeah. they're just not accurate. Because they're not accurate, right, right. The ones that would have reported that are not reporting, yes, would right. drag down the actual performance. Right. But there are a lot of managers in the marketplace that really do not report their numbers still. Right. Depending on their strategy, depending on their capacity constraints, depending on their institutionalization, they may not be aware of it. They may be, although they say that the two person, the Bloomberg's dead, that's actually not true. There are people managing money still that way. They're still putting up good numbers with under 100 million that are earning a couple million dollars a year that may or may not be reporting their information. All I'm suggesting to you is, I know it's not accurate because we have clients that are up 20, 30% for the year. And I'm not here to promote those clients. Right. I'm just saying I know it's not accurate to what, I'm t what I hear everybody else saying about the market. Fair enough. Chris, do you have any thoughts? Sure, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a function of your perspective and your expectations. Right? Are you based in the U.S.? Are you based in U.S.? I'm sorry, in, in Europe? Are you based in the Middle East? In, a, in Asia? I thought you got it right the first time. Well, there's two parts of the U.S. I guess you know, based upon today, we'll probably see if it's 50-50, 49-51. However, it falls out. I, I'm not staying up late tonight, anyways. Um, but that being said, you know, investors from around the world and how they view markets and how they gauge their expectations are very different. Um, I think especially in hedge funds, you can have a very wide dispersion of returns in various asset classes and strategies, so therefore the index or the average can be a bit misleading and depending on reporting. But at the, like I said, I think at the end of the day, if you're looking at a manager and say, oh, it's a long short equity manager, they're net 60, you have a month like October, and they're down eight, you're asking a lot of, a lot of tough questions at that point in time because as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's way outside the realm of expectations. Um, okay, so hedge funds are not dead, right? They're still here. Uh, $3 trillion industry by some estimates. I, I think that's high, but, but that's a whole other story. Um, Ron, how are they adopting in this environment uh, and evolving, uh, you know, given, given uh, where we are? So there are, the question I've been getting in the last three, four weeks, people are asking me, are hedge funds actually launching? Because I keep reading in the press about all the closures. They are launching post-08. We've seen a larger percentage of funds launched in the form of private equity versus hedge, but there are hedge funds launching. And there are, they take various, um, they employ various strategies. We're seeing global macro, we're seeing crypto, or had seen more crypto. We've seen crypto tail off a little bit, although while I was in the audience, I got an email from somebody launching a crypto fund from a very well-known family office to um, long only, whether that's a hedge fund, we can argue that, global macro. What we've been seeing is what do people need to do to go to the marketplace now? And going into structure, uh, founders class is something that for the last two or three years, anybody who's looked into creating a fund or investing in a fund should be familiar with the term. Fundamentally, it's ha creating a class in advance that has lower fees, and um, some other benefits, generally in return for locking their capital up for a longer period of time than an average LP coming in, but it's for the first movers into the fund. We've also seen a but they're not seeding in that situation. No, there they are not seeding. Uh, and for those in the marketplace who, who aren't familiar with the terms we're talking about, a seeder is somebody who commits a certain amount of capital to a vehicle and in return generally receives a percentage of the manager fee earned by the manager and a percentage of the incentive earned by the manager, often in perpetuity, but sometimes it has a time horizon uh, where it expires. It's called the sunset provision. The other things that we've been seeing a trend over the last three years or four years, and um, the gentleman from K2 can probably confirm this, rather than people negotiating a lower fee, so let's say, for argument's sake, I'm still living in the world from five years ago and the manager is charging two and 20. Instead of negotiating in for one in 10, the allocator wants to make sure the manager is focused on returns and not worried about paying their bills. They'll negotiate that we'll, we'll pay you two in 20, but when your AUM gets to, uh, assets in the fund get to a certain level where we think you should be able to cover your costs, that's when we want the discount to kick in. And so instead of paying two, maybe when you hit $500 million, if you do, our 2% will go to 1% or maybe go to zero. So that's another trend we've seen people engage in to track capital. Andrew, do you have a See, basically uh, what we are seeing is that the hedge fund manager is trying to temper the franchise risk really because they do understand that the assets under management are kind of temporal. You know, it can move at a short notice. 
So what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get into 40 Act funds. Just a way to, for them to diversify revenues. The other thing is this, today the hedge funds are more open to doing separately managed accounts or doing one-off transactions with large institutions because by doing that, they're still able to maintain those relationships because many of the large institutional investors don't want to invest in the fund, the commingled vehicle, because they don't like all the line items. They're looking for some specific exposure to be additive to their existing portfolio. So there is a growing trend in for managers to do SMAs and one-off transactions. So um, I'll respectfully either disagree or, or modify your response. So you've heard, of, I think it was Vanguard. One of, like two years ago, I think it was Vanguard reported the largest AUM it's ever had, yet it saw a drop in its revenue because they were moving to low uh, price products. And you started to see some of these firms getting into more of the private equity or hedge fund space. I would, I would take the position that you're seeing managers drop their fees because that's what they need to do to sell it. When they're trying to create registered products like either a mutual fund or a registered investment company or a USIT if they're in Europe. The, the um, high net worth investor, institutional investor, looks for something different than the retail investor. Um, you actually even were mentioning about hedge, product, hedge fund products serving a different purpose and some people might even suggest that they serve based on the indices. We've seen price compression because that's what the marketplace has demanded based on the returns and based on the demand or appetite. And you, and you had asked about seed deals. From a seeding perspective, it's a buyer's time, not a seller's time. So we're seeing fewer seed deals and less money going into the space, it seems, and having a higher expectation. And the other trend we're seeing, family offices, my understanding, were instead of writing, well, there was family offices or institutional investors. Instead of, if they were writing 10 checks five years ago to 10 different firms, they might be increasing their allocations, but to a smaller number of underlying managers. So instead of 10 checks for $100, it might be five checks for $200. So we're seeing a whole host of different trends that are influencing how products go to market. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. Okay. See, basically, I would tend to disagree with you because for fee for me is not a reason to invest in the fund. Just because someone is offering you one in 10, that doesn't mean he's a good, candidate relative to someone charging me 3 and 30. What I'm looking for is the returns after the fees, you know. My You're starting asking what's point the net is not number. The I'm my not suggesting this is about you, by the way. No, I'm just saying, yeah. you know, as a allocator, my clients are not looking for just a discounted fee. They're looking for the overall economics. And there, there could be scenarios where we are paying 3 and 30 and still getting 20%. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, my only point I, I, I'm is that I'm not disagreeing with you either. The low words, you don't go to Kmart to buy your hedge fund. Better performance. That. It's no, you know, it's not a replication. It's not a proxy for better performance just because my fee is one in ten. Right. Well, yeah. A little comment on that. So I, I completely agree. What you care about is the net return, but there are. I want to point out there are investors in certain parts of the world that care greatly about fees and and. I think it's a function of the general underperformance that we started to talk about, too, right? I mean, it, you know, if, if, if that wasn't the context, then I think people would be much more comfortable with, you know, 3 and 30 or whatever it is. I, I also want to say, I think, I think hedge fund launches and hedge fund industry itself, it's, as it's been maturing, it's morphing truly into the investment management industry. As Ron was uh, alluding to with, with USITS, with Fortiac, you're seeing other managers that launch as a hedge fund launching a long-only fund as an ancillary product at a lower fee base that gives investors the option. Do I want a hedge product? Do I want a, you know, the best of my long-only book? And it's, it's, it's giving them scale, where at one time, if they're only getting to be able to make, maybe raise 300 or 400 million in their fund, where operationally, that's a tight, you know, that's a tight asset range to be able to support a team of you know, individuals from the investment side, the op side, the regulatory side that you can raise up to a billion rather quickly in a long-only fund, although you know, lower fees, but gives you a much greater operational efficiency to be in the marketplace and have longevity. There are a lot of examples. My, my favorite would probably be AQR, which has really become an investment management company mm -hmm. that sells mutual funds. <laughs> right? Well, it, there's also investment management companies becoming hedge funds. So right. No, Wellington, that's right. Yeah. Wellington has a large hedge fund practice. 
Western Asset Management. Right. Um, okay, so we're investors. We want to look forward always, not, not backwards. Um, uh, Chris, uh, in this environment, you know, the Fed is, it seems like we're in a tightening cycle, whether we agree, you know, we could debate whether that's a good idea or not, but I think they've communicated that very clearly. Um, as we move uh, into this tightening uh, from an easing uh, cycle, uh, you know, what strategies are you thinking about uh, and, and uh, what strategies are you interested in? Sure. I think, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. The fact of the matter is with the Fed tightening um, and, the cent and the European Central Bank actually alluding to tightening next year and, and, and reducing uh, asset purchases and the Bank of Japan also a bit under pressure as well to reduce their, um, uh, reduce their stimulus, you know, we're finally in a cycle of tightening and less stimulus, uh, less liquidity that I think is going to bring more fundamental approach to investing back in, in FAD where the last 10 years really you could be passive long only and perform quite well, um, but you didn't have to put much thought into it. Um, I think uh, the markets, I think uh, managers, I think over or underestimated the effect that the Fed was gonna have on the marketplace and uh, the way it's, it's performed the last 10 years. Um, that being said, um, you know, the DNA on our firm has always been macro or low net equity long short which I think is in a, in a great place right now. I think for macro investors to have the dynamic ability to invest across asset classes, strategies, and regions um, really gives them a, a, a little bit of a, of a benefit right now. We've, we're starting to see a little bit of a break on performance across, uh, across a set, and I'm talking more so on the discretionary side, not the systematic side. Um, and then low, low net or moderate net equity long short, very good stock pickers and those that have the ability to short and willing to short in this market. As we've seen, um, some of the, the strong winners have, have had some dramatic downturns in October. And if uh, managers were able to catch it, then they were able to generate some strong alpha. Um, and you know, looking even further out, I think the place to start looking actually is distressed credit. Um, as we move further down the tightening cycle and further into the economic cycle, I think distressed credit is going to be a very, very strong area to play. Uh, the trick there, I think, is not getting in too early because there may be a few legs down, not just one leg down. Rob, do you have any, uh, any thoughts? Uh, similar view. So we like, uh, I think, emerging market distressed credit will be interesting. I agree that it's, it's uh, early, but we're, it takes a long time for us to get set up, so we're, we're spending a lot of time researching that. We, we're uh, overweight macro, uh, discretionary global macro. Um, I, I think, uh, what else, fixed income, relative value trading, and volatility trading. Are the return of macro, is that what I'm hearing here today? That What's that? Ma macro's the, macro's the theme, yeah. <laughs> That's what she's, usually a bad sign, but yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, it's the theme. Andrew? So from my vantage point, you know, we have seen an increased interest for spread products. If you look at the HFRI index for asset-backed, which kind of is a proxy for structured credit, you would see the index outperforming during periods of rising interest rates. Case in point is if you look at the period from, say, June of 2002, 2012, sorry, through end of 2013, the treasuries, the 10-year treasury, spreads increased from 1.5 to almost 2.8% at the end of 2013. During this time, the index was almost up by 18%. It outperformed, actually, the Barclays aggregated bond index by over 1,800 points, basis points. So there is an interest in um, structured credit. It could be select legacy RMBS or something which is non-residential. Also, we are seeing interest in real assets. You know, 15 years ago, people used to think that gold is kind of a hedge against inflation. And now real assets are kind of a hedge against inflation. If you look at the real assets, you know, they cover almost $11 trillion in market cap across the globe. And real assets primarily consist of three asset classes infrastructure, natural resources, and real estate. So given that most of the institutions already invest in real estate, that's not the bucket they're trying to expand. They're trying to put more towards natural resources as well as infrastructure. Um, I want to go back and talk about fees just a little bit. Um, you know, 
how much fee pressure is there now in the industry? I'll, I'll just open that up to, to the panel. And, and is, there, is there any reversal coming? There doesn't necessarily seem to be reversal on the average. There's a lot of fee pressure. It started kicking in in 2008, 2009. Going back, what was said earlier, it's a function of your net returns. So those managers that are putting up good numbers consistently can charge higher fees. But the, so it's, it really goes down to who, who are you asking that to? So if we're looking to the existing asset management industry and where you are in the herd uh, that you're competing against, I think that, that um, comparable pricing is gonna play in to where you are in returns. Nobody says it that way. I, I'm focused right now on emerging managers because I've been dealing with that topic for the last couple of weeks. There was a fund to funds I had a panel I was at earlier today and she said they would never allocate to anybody who's charging more than 150 basis points on margin fee, they don't even get into a conversation. Now, whether the, I also remember somebody 15 years ago from AIG who used to seed funds saying they would never seed somebody or ever pay more than 100 basis points. And obviously that was the way of the dust. So there are people that make statements like this as to where fees are. My impression is we're seeing fees between 125 basis points and 175 basis points somewhere in that range on average. With regard to incentive, somewhere between 10 and 15 seems to be more common, even though we, ha we have other managers who are well profiled who are charging no management fee, so it's expenses plus 30, or people, very, very few, but some people putting in hurdles with a higher uh, incentive. See, basically, I believe that you know, the managers are open to more or better distribution of economics. You know, they do realize that at the end of the day, investor is taking some amount of risk and there's asymmetrical information between the investor and the investee. So the way to compensate the investor is really by having a better sharing of economics. Now, if you think of Steve Cohen, right? When he started the first fund, we were invested at Gore-Tex and we were paying what? 3% and 50%. That's the first iteration of the fund. And people were happy to pay him 3 and 50%. Now, if you look at the newer iteration that he's launching, in the process of launching, he's just charging, you know, he has an incentive fee structure which varies from 10% to 50%, but it has a hurdle to it. It's not that everything is 50%, everything is 10%, depending on how much he can deliver. So I believe, you know, this is not something that will go away will continue having a better sharing of the economics between the manager and the investor. Rob, do you have any, uh, any feelings? It, it, well, the industry is definitely under fee pressure. I, I agree that it depends. there's a differentiation of managers, so some managers can, that can charge higher fees are. Um, uh, but, but we've also seen more, uh, like, t investors have choice. So. Uh, lower management fee, maybe a higher uh, incentive fee, and then so they may have one or two different options. Sure. Uh, varying, we're seeing more and more of the, the zero and 30, which was mentioned earlier, which is um, obviously all towards the manager. But. Um, so I was on a, a panel uh, yesterday uh, talking about uh, AI and ML uh, in investment management uh, contexts. Uh, what do you guys think? Like, is that, uh, Chris, is that something that within the hedge fund world is interesting to you? Um, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, we're always looking for new and innovative strategies. I think uh, the important thing to realize is that, look, it's, it's in its early stages, it's in its infancy, and it hasn't gone through a cycle or a market turn or correction. Um, so a number of strategies that you have to remember, you know, we go back to Quant 101, we're looking backward on a, a variable time frame scale. So these algorithms, these systems are all built on data that one can question the viability or the valuable, the, you know, how valuable this data is and the robustness. Um, if you go back to prior periods, pre-2007, maybe into the 80s, or test them over longer time frames, they may have more um, you know, robustness and viability. But I think we have to experience it in real time to understand how these systems work because it's built as a system, right? It's built like with the theory of the human body. You have interactive systems that work together to build a larger, fully functional organism. 
and I don't know if they've been tested long enough that if something happens in one area of the market that it shuts down other parts of the system on the trading front that could you know, lead to either an underperformance or some sort of um, uh, problem in the fund. I think, I think there needs to be a, a little bit more data available to us before we get a higher level of comfort. But I'm very interested in these, in, in these strategies because you know, at the end of the day, you know, time moves forward. This is probably at the forefront of the industry and it's just a matter of time as to which systems prove to be more um, uh, productive um, either through various markets or, or different asset classes. Rob, do you agree? I, I do agree. It's definitely the, the, the most interesting front edge of the research, and there's a lot of uh, top managers dedicating a lot of time and money into the research. Uh, but, but right now, so, so we have the same view. It's like wait and see. Uh, we do think there's scale in some, uh, that it's good, but more, it's not, there's many forms of quant in, in AI, but um, if a manager can use quantitative techniques or modeling or, or software to cover more data, unstructured data faster, and to help help him or her come to conclusions that they would have come to anyway. That's, uh, we see that as kind of where the state of the, the world is now, and it's the implementation of quant, but it's not, it's not pure, true AI. See, I would completely agree with Rob, because you know, using AI has become more of a marketing buzzword and just because you use AI does not make you a superior manager, literally. Because it's hard for managers to articulate what is the value addition by using AI. You know, what is it that they would have missed without AI? Just to Rob's point, that if you can get something similar by using just the fundamental data, you don't have to use AI, right? Because a simpler model is better than a complex model. So unless, and the history we have had for AI is kind of short. The first AI fund was probably launched four or five years ago. So based on short history, and given the complexity of financial data, the financial data is non-stationary because your correlations, your averages keep changing all the time. So non-stationarity combined with short history makes it a leap of faith today for me to recommend a AI manager. One other topic I wanted uh, to put in front of you guys, and Anirudh, I'd like to start with you, because you used to be in the fund of funds business, uh, and, and now you're on the consulting side. Let's talk about the emergence and importance of consulting in this hedge fund industry. See, basically, if you look at the fund of funds industry, it has gone through some form of a reformation since the crisis, because a part of the business of fund of funds has been kind of gone to consultants. And uh, I think consultants recently, you know, have gotten some bad rap. I don't know if you saw this study. It was published by Oxford University, which basically there were two professors from Oxford who wrote this paper, What Lies Beneath the Consultants. In terms of they looked at the actual recommendations made by consultants for 10 years from 2005 through 2016, and they actually found that the value addition was kind of not significantly different than zero. Within that asset class, if they had just thrown the dots and picked up the manager, they would have had similar returns. But what that paper does not identify is that the consultants are kind of driven by the mandate, right? If I have a certain mandate, I have to live by the mandate. You know, if you think of it, as a parallel example, if I'm a broker in New York City and Rob calls me and tells me, hey, I want an apartment on Fifth Avenue overlooking the park. So basically, you know, the only parameters I have is it has to be between 63rd Street and 130th Street, right? I cannot really show him properties which are, say, in Brooklyn Heights or in Long Island City, though for me, they have more value, but he wants something on Fifth Avenue. I, that's what I have to deliver. So if my investor wants something with low wall, low drawdown, I have to stick to that because at the end of the day, I'm not the CIO. The CIO is someone else. I have to just respect the mandate. Chris, I think you had a similar career trajectory. Can, can you also talk about it? Yes, yes, I'm also a former fund of funds. I, I feel like I'm in a, in a group right now. Um, and 
um, yeah, no, it's, it's been a very interesting dynamic change from the fund of funds and the consultancy. I think both are critical and important because um, when allocating the hedge funds, it really is a special skill set that it takes from both the qualitative, which I think is almost as important than the quantitative side of finding, developing, monitoring, and approving managers for investment within a diversified portfolio. Um, the difference being is that, um, you know, at one time the hedge fund of funds had a uh, commingled product that would either go to an institutional or a retail investor where consultants tend to be a bit more advisory, but you're seeing a little bit of a confluence now between the two um, where advisory bespoke customized solutions um, are becoming a little bit more of the main line of business or, 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 or strong line of business. Um, and, uh, and appropriately so. I think it's just a, a function of the, uh, the industry maturing from one where investors were more willing to cede discretion to um, you know, allocators of capital to hedge funds. And today, they want to have more influence and be the choice um, as to how they're going to be allocating uh, their capital through a, through a more advisory approach. But do you think it's also based on the mindset that it was a function of getting allocations? Fund the funds, in my mind, from 15 years ago had access to managers that mere mortals did not have access to. And so the fund the funds were created as a way to give distribution power to that go-between. Absolutely. That was one of the rationale why people And I invest. think that's Absolutely. the trend we're seeing. And then post-08, that the demographic who invested in hedge funds has materially changed. It started from high net, go back 20 years ago, if we're trying to understand where we are today, is predominantly high net worth and family office, and around 2008, a little bit before and definitely after, it became much more institutional. So we saw more institutionalization of managers where the results were 10% of the population of fund managers were managing roughly 90% of the fund's assets. And it, it, it has affected how consultants conduct their business, how they can allocate, because they're allocated amongst multiple clients, and so they need to have the underlying manager have the capacity to accept the assets, and also there's a risk aversion to the consultant. The consultant could be put to death by lions if they allocate to a new startup manager who's not well recognized, and somebody who's well recognized and they both equally underperform. The question would be asked, well, why did you go with the lesser known? Whereas it's less likely you're gonna be asked, well, you picked the good manager, I guess it was just the law, you know, the, average of, the law of averages. I think, I think an important piece, too, is you go back in time, a billion dollars was a billion dollars, and that was considered a very large manager. Like, that caused concern for investors. Today, you can have a $20 billion fund, and people are like, oh, everything's great, it's $20 billion. And it's also that the second part is a function of who were the investors? Family offices, retail investors, retail distribution platforms. Institutions came into flux in 2008 and came in strong into the industry. And with that kind of money and capital flows into the industry, the dynamics change dramatically. Yeah, and I expectation think of return is exactly. one of those things. So when we're talking about benchmarks, my personal expectation of return and my risk tolerance is far different than somebody running an insurance company that has to worry about their worries. I'm more willing to take on risk, although maybe in the long run I shouldn't be. But that piece plays into capacity, where at one time you're thinking, okay, well, a billion dollars is capacity for this strategy, that's how it's gonna work. Now, again, you could be talking three to five billion dollars capacity. Consultants can push that money into those funds a lot quicker and a lot more easily than what your traditional um, investors or avenues with the fund of funds used to be. And again, that's negotiating capacity. I remember back in my days in Permal in 07, 08, was that, okay, look, we can get 200 million of capacity, better fees, um, you know, compared to another manager or allocator. Um, and you're like, okay, great, the cap's gonna be about a billion dollars. Well, the managers move that goalpost once the consultants came in and start saying, well, here's a ticket for 500 million. Well, that, that changes did the whole I, dynamic. Did I say a billion? I meant 10 billion. Ten, 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 yeah. well, well, this is rounding error. Um, I want to open this up if anyone wants to ask any questions. All Call right. food coma. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you guys doing this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.